Welcome to the Royal Society Centre for History of Science. Our speaker today is Dr. Clemency Fisher, who is Curator of Vertebrate Zoology at the National Museums Liverpool. And the topic of her talk today is The Zoological World of Edward Lear. Thanks very much for that. And just to say, I'm very pleased that John Gould's uh, descendant, Maureen Lambourne's here. I didn't know she was coming, so that's a great treat. So if you want to ask anything about John Gould, she's here with the purple top. <laughs> and also Gina Douglas is here, um, who's just, well, she's supposed to have retired from the Linnaean Society um, as the librarian, but actually she still goes in nearly every day. Um, but she's here too. So if you're interested in the Linnaean Society, um, which also has a lot of uh, connection with Lear, then... Uh, that's your lady. Um, I've got quite a lot of slides, so I will kind of um, go through them quite quickly. But obviously, we've got questions at the end. Um, so please do ask anything you like, and I will immediately refer it to these two. Um, Edward Lear, it's his 200th birthday this year, um, as is actually some other really important people, Charles Dickens. Um, John Gilbert, who's the chap I work on, who uh, worked for John Gould, uh, they were both Londoners. Um, Welshman John Lord Stokes, he's 200 this year, he was captain of the Beagle. Uh, the 1812 Overture is 200 years old today, and uh, this year, and so is Canada. So Lear is in very good company. He was born in Holloway in North London, um, now part of Islington on the 12th of May, 1812, and he was the 21st child um, of his parents. So his mother actually had 21 children. He was the last, and he was raised by his sister Anne, who was quite a good artist herself. Um, most people are used to seeing this sort of picture of uh, Edward Lear. This is a self-portrait um, that he did in pen and ink um, in a private collection. So most people usually see him as this kind of rotund person with funny little glasses and a beard um, doing strange things like sitting on a very small piano stool and playing the piano very, very badly. And indeed, this is kind of the portrait that you would remember um, seeing as um, connected with him. This is a crayon and chalk done by Holman Hunt um, in 1857. Uh, Hunt was one of the founders of the pre-Raphaelite movement, and this did really influence um, Edward Lear's later artwork, and to an extent did um, influence the way he did his natural history art and even his cartoons. Um, Edward Lear, at this, at this moment, was 45. He's most famous, of course, for his nonsense rhymes, which were written for the children at Knowsley Hall, which is just about eight miles due east of Liverpool. Um, so that's really why I got, I got involved, because, of course, that's where I'm from. Um, the Owl and the Pussycat, uh, seen here in the um, Royal Academy produced plate, um, with some of his images all the way around the outside, it has been voted by a popular newspaper as the most popular children's rhyme that was in a national competition. Um, and actually, it does go on, because I noticed I got the, um, the Folio Society catalogue um, just before I left, and I had it, I was reading it on the train. I noticed there's a new edition of his complete nonsense here, um, and it just, I was interested in what they said. Um, Bosch, as Lear remarked, re requires a good deal of care and he lavished it on his own creations. And that really says it all, that although m and many people will see his cartoons as being really carefully um, produced, a lot of people just think he dashed them off. And actually, there always was a lot of thought behind them. Um, one of the ones here that I'm showing is the abstemious ass who lived in a bar barrel and only lived on soda water and pickled cucumbers and actually the ass he remembered from Knowsley Park because the ass was a terrible beast that chased the coachman up a tree and left him there all night while braying at the bottom and circling the bottom of the tree 
And people kept saying, why is that thing braying? Oh, and this poor chap was stuck up the tree all night. <laughs> um, so a lot of the animals that you see in Lear's cartoons were actually uh, individuals that he knew from Knowsley Hall. And if you look at the um, Gould's Birds of Europe outside, Volume 1, I think it's just on the back of this wall here, you'll see that um, the owl in that looks very like the great horned owl in the picture. And I'm now wondering is whether we can locate that specimen. So that's something I'm going to go home and do. Owl and the Pussycat, there is, if you go on the web, um, there is a website which is called the Owl and the Pussycat Translation Collection. <coughs> and it has been translated into well over 100 languages. This includes Manx Gaelic, Lakosa Indian, or Native American, I should say, Morse code. <laughs> it's very interesting, that one. I'm afraid I can't actually tell you what it says. Um, my particular favourite is Klingon, <laughs> as in Star Trek. So, as you can see, that certainly goes on, and he's more popular than he was when he was alive now. Many versions of the owl and the pussycat um, have been done. I, I love this one where the owl's um, owning up to the fact that this is not the only pussycat that he's been with. Um, and I love Linton Lamb's picture on the right here <coughs> with the tail just going down into the water. I think that's absolutely beautiful. And wherever you look, you can see people's versions of the cartoons Edward Lear was once a young man, and he did once um, look, you know, like an ordinary strapping young man. This is him in 1840 by Willem Marstrand. This is in the National Portrait Gallery. Um, and he was just as famous for his natural history art as for his limericks and rhymes. Here are two of his pictures. Uh, these are in the collections at Knowsley Hall. Um, still today, um, kept in great big solander boxes so that they're away from the light and they're absolutely as beautiful um, as they were when he painted them. Rather unusually, um, a chimpanzee on the left, um, Lear didn't do a great deal of the upper primates. Mostly he painted from animals at the London Zoo and from Lord Derby's menagerie at Knowsley Hall. Um, so um, to, this must have been um, a chimpanzee in somebody's private collection. The um, specimen on the right is a Thais Argus, um, an African soft-shelled turtle, which was brought back alive by the explorer Thomas Whitfield, who worked for Lord Derby in Africa. Um, and if you look outside, you'll see a lot of Thomas Bell's uh, monographs on the turtles and the tortoises that um, have been put out by Felicity. Um, and I think this must be um, one of the ones that he did for Thomas Bell. Um, he did a lot of the turtles for those publications. Really beautiful pe painting, very accurate. Um, if he did uh, pictures from living specimens, it was much more obvious um, that they looked like they really should. I think some of the pictures he did from museum specimens are much more kind of rigid, but really beautiful specimens. He also did this from the underneath. Um, Lear started off painting natural history specimens when he was very, very young. He actually decided to do a book on the parrots, and this was just after the London Zoo had opened. Um, this is a picture of the waterfowl lawn at the Zoological Gardens in Regent's Park by George Scharf in 1835, really not long after it opened. Um, Lear must have started sketching birds there very early on after its opening. Um, he, he was already sketching there in 1828 um, when he was only 16 when he embar embarked on his parrot book. And I think that's where... Lord Derby must have met him because Lord Derby, the 13th Earl, was one of the founders of the London Zoo. Um, and you can just imagine him wandering around the, gar the gardens with his entourage and his cane and looking very 
uh, gentlemanly and coming across this rather scruffy youth aged 16 sketching parrots and Lord Derby just went that's what I want can you come to Knowsley and paint my parrots for me and that's what happened Lear's original artwork is very scattered now it's just like everybody else you have to go all over the world trying to reconstruct um, all the stages of somebody painting and coming up with their finished product these are in the house and library at Harvard and they've just been um, the subject of a very intense fellowship by Robert McCracken Peck who's one of the curators at the Philadelphia Academy of Science. Um, and uh, this one was an um, original sketch that Lear did from a parrot in private hands. It's an immature grey cheek parrot, parakeet, Rosageris pyropterus, and it was painted by Lear in August 1830 from a living parrot at Mr Nic Nicholas Vigor's house. And you can just see him recording this in the writing underneath the parrot. Um, Nicholas Vigors, was, who was an Irishman, co-founded the zoo, um, the Zoological Society of London in 1826, and was its secretary till 1833. And Lear's writing says uh, further to that, that it was brought to England by the King of the Sandwich Islands, that's obviously uh, now called Hawaii, um, together with another specimen since dead, you just see that writing down to the right there. Specimen since dead. So just interesting the way he recorded what he was painting and where it was from. The Great Cheek Parrot is actually from South America, not Hawaii. Um, so this was one of the specimens that Bob um, has been uh, researching. And here he is, Robert McCracken Peck who's got one of the most wonderful sets of whiskers I've ever seen on anybody. Um, he came over very recently to give a talk at the Linnan Society on Edward Lear, um, and he knows far more than I do about him. Um, he's done, as I say, a special project at the Houghton Library and has just produced a catalogue. It's part of the Harvard University Bulletin um, about the display they did found in... Uh, on his work that he's done, um, which is up at, in Boston at the moment. It's, uh, I, unfortunately, I couldn't get to the exhibition, but the catalogue is really worth getting. Lear did manage to produce his illustrations of the parrots um, in 1838, um, sorry, 1832. And this is the title page for it on the left. Um, it was, in the end, the only book he managed to produce himself on natural history subject. He did lots of work for other people, like John Gould um, or Jardine, uh, Sir William Jardine. He did work for, um, obviously, Thomas Bell. Um, so he did lots of paintings for other people's books, but this was the only book he produced himself. Um, the uh, plates all were done from... Parrots either at the London Zoo or from Lord Derby's menagerie uh, and Avery at uh, Knowsley. But some of them were done from Lord Derby's museum. He had his own museum. And when things in the Avery and menagerie died, they were prepared and put into his museum. But this was a parrot that he had been sent, already dead, from the kind of Chinese uh, Indian area. And it's actually the Lord Derby's parakeet. It's a specimen, a species that is named after the 13th Earl. And that's the original. Um, if you look at uh, Lear's illustrations of the parrot, you'll see that the printed plate looks very, very much like that. And we actually do have the specimen from that, which that's painted in our collection. And it actually looks very like that too. Um, so you can see all the methods that, uh, that uh, Lear went to to paint his specimens. So you can see here he's using, um, trying to get the colour right, and he's using lots of little brush strokes with different colours on them. And sometimes he writes, no, that's not right, and sometimes he'll say things like, too green. So he, went, he took a very great deal of care to get the right colour. Um, for his uh, paintings. 
This is the 13th Earl of Derby. He's a, a quiet, retiring, scholarly man who loved talk, nothing more than talking about birds with his colleagues such as John Gould, who used to come and stay at Nosey Hall. And John Gould was actually a gardener's son. Um, so it just shows that um, he really didn't care where people came from as long as they could talk the talk that he loved so much. He was a, I think he was a quiet and scholarly man because his father certainly wasn't. His father, the 12th Earl, was the chap who invented the Derby and the Oaks, the races, and was a bit of a racing man and actually married his second wife, was a publican's daughter, um, so, who was very much taller than him. So there's some absolutely great caricatures of those two from the time. I think they re lived quite a... Um, a racy life in London, and their son, one thinks, um, as a result, um, loved Nosley, didn't like London at all, and all he wanted to do was have the biggest aviary and menagerie um, that anyone could have at Nosley Hall. He managed to persuade Lear to come and paint his parrots um, and paint some of the other specimens in his aviary at Nosley Hall, and this was a painting... Um, a, sorry, a pencil sketch of Nosley Hall that Edward Lear did in September 1835. He actually lived at Nosley for most of the years from 1831 to 1837. And um, you can see here Edward Lear's style, uh, is, I just, which I just love, um, which is very... I think he did things very quickly, but they just give um, a really good impression of this subject that he's doing. This is the west side of Nosley Hall. There's a little group of Stanleys there. Whenever he does a little group of Stanleys, there's always a dog, funnily enough. So there's a little dog on the right there. Nosley Hall still looks very similar to about here. This wing got pulled down just before the war. Um, and there's another wing here that was demolished. But if you go there today, it does look very much the same. And they still have most of the specimens, uh, the pictures that Lear did for Lord Derby. Um, the Avery and Menagerie in Nosley Park was, in the end, the biggest private zoo that's ever been known. It was absolutely enormous. And um, Lord Derby actually built a wall, um, mostly to keep poachers out, but also to keep his animals in. And if you follow the wall, which is all the way round the inner part of the estate. It's actually 10 miles long. And in, within that wall, you had all sorts of things. So you had llamas, alpacas, all sorts of weird beasts down here. Um, Lord Derby's elands, species named after Lord Derby, which is the biggest antelope known. They all lived in the paddocks. And all sorts of things, including the Sandwich Island goose, um, or nene, which Lord Derby really was uh, credited with rescuing from extinction. Um, and here's the hall here. All this area here was full of the, the more uh, difficult to keep birds, a lot of which had heated environments for them. <clears throat> and the kangaroos and the porcupines lived up here in the kennels. So you can imagine what it must have sounded like if you lived in the house. <laughs> And the thing that really interests me about the old names for a lot of these animals that we used at the time, the whiskered yark is a monkey, the Icotoon is, um, is a deer, Jinga Jonga is actually Lord Derby's eland, so they're all original names from places like India where they came from. So just imagine if you're Edward Lear and you're living there, would you not get the idea of using weird names for your creatures? So there he was in the house going, oh, these things are so noisy. Um, and hearing the Avery keepers, uh, menagerie keepers, talking about animals with these funny names. <clears throat> so there you are. That's where he got his weird names from, I think. Some of the Avery still exist. Um, this was actually built by his father to keep pheasants in. Um, and also... Um, the, the 12th Earl was really into cockfighting. He actually had a species of uh, a variety of cockfighting uh, chicken called after him. Um, but uh, the 13th Earl adapted this for much more interesting and rare pheasants. 
um, <clears throat> guans and other sorts of birds from all over the world. It actually had heated pipes in the back and you can still see all the heated pipes and things. So it's an amazing structure. And if you look at a lot of uh, Lear's cartoons, they are, you can see all the, the animals that he knew at Knowsley turn up one way or an another. Um, these were some papier mache models that Gordon Stowell, who no, sadly is no longer with us, um, did for um, uh, ex the exhibition we had uh, 10 years ago. And you can actually, if you look at the birds, you can see which, what species each one is. And in lots of cases, um, we've got the specimens on which they were based. And I just love looking through and going, oh, yeah, I know that one. <clears throat> That's Nosley Hall now. Um, and really... Most of Lear's art, as I say, is still there. The original art he did for Lord Derby, a lot of which was published later in illustrations of this Sitakidae, and particularly in Gleanings from the Menagerie in Avery at Knowsley Hall, which was published um, in 1846. Uh, it was published by uh, John Gray, who worked at the British Museum. Um, he wrote um, all the text... But in volume one, Lear did all the pictures. Um, and you will see there's a copy um, out there. And it's incredibly rare. I don't think it was pu privately published by Lord Derby. I think there were probably only something like 100 printed. Uh, Lord Derby still got two of them. There's one here. Um, but they are quite difficult to find. So do have a look because it's a real privilege to see them. Um, the specimens, though, that Edward Lear... Um, drew um, were bequeathed when Lord Derby was getting an old man. He started to talk about what he should do with his um, specimens in his museum and what he should do with the Avery and Menagerie. His son, who was later the 14th Earl, was not interested at all. He was the one that ended up being Prime Minister, um, I think, three times. So he, again, like his grandfather, lived in London. He wasn't interested in being at Knowsley. He wasn't interested in natural history. So he said, right, I'm just going to sell everything, um, you know, to his father. So um, his father realised the menagerie and Avery would probably have to be sold, but he certainly didn't want his museum breaking up. So he was going to give it to the British Museum. And the British Museum went, yeah, well, you know, we've got a lot of these already. And um, his daughter-in-law, Emma, said, well, why don't you give it to the people of Liverpool? They haven't got a museum. Um, it is virtually in Liverpool, your house. Um, and don't you think it would be good to found a museum in Liverpool? So that's where I come in, because I look after his museum collection, um, which is the founding collection of what is now National Museums Liverpool. And I won't do it now, but one of the lectures I did in the past, I managed to prove that Lord Derby's bequest was directly responsible for Liverpool being capital of culture in 2008. <laughs> and there's a lot of truth in it. Um, it's a very cultural place, and it's also the only national museum service in England outside London. And directly responsible is his wonderful collection, which I cherish, and which actually I'm still just after 37 years not working on anymore. It's very strange. Um, again, we can look at uh, the way that Edward Lear produced his art. Um, so he started off sketching birds. When he got bored, he did little vignettes. So here he's been doing um, a picture of a blue rump parrot, Sitticus uh, cyanurus there on the left that's not coloured. Started doing that, got a bit bored, decided he'd draw, draw, draw an ecclesi ecclesiastical figure there on the right with parrots on his head. <laughs> and he, then he started doing um, a picture of a golden parakeet. You can just see some of it up there on the top right, just here. Got a bit bored with that, so he decided to do a little vignette from Nosley Hall. There's a bush and a little bit of the house in the background. And there's some Stanleys with a little dog. And there's one of the Stanleys with an impossible waist, of course. 
Um, and if you look at a lot of the, uh, this again is in the Houghton, and a lot of those, the, the thing that's really interesting about these sketches is the little doodles that Lear's done. Um, and sometimes you can actually tell the people in them and that sort of thing. So here's that little original from the Houghton. Lear then did a proper sketch. You can see he's now coloured in the wings on the golden parrot and he's labelled it properly. That's a finished sketch. And if you look at um, illustrations of the sitaki dai, um, that finished lithograph is in there. And here we have the specimen from which he drew it, which was at the time alive in the aviary. When it died, it was prepared as a, what we call a study skin or a cabinet skin. And it's in our collections at National Museums Liverpool now. And one of the great things when I did the, um, the Lord Derby exhibition in 2002 was linking. We went through all Edward Lear's pictures and we linked them up with specimens where they existed in our collection. And actually, it's an incredible amount of them still exist. I think sometimes the specimens weren't prepared or perhaps they went to London because Lord Derby swapped a lot of stuff with the British Museum. So I have found quite a lot of stuff um, of these uh, original specimens in the collections um, at Tring, the British Museum collections at Tring and in South Kensington. This is the Stanley Crane. Um, it was named after Lord Stanley when he was still Lord Stanley. The eldest son is always called Lord Stanley. When they, um, when they attain to the uh, earldom, they become Lord Derby. Um, so this was when the 12th Earl was still alive, but um, the Lord Stanley was already very, very interested in natural history. So Lear painted this Stanley Crane. It's his, uh, his original painting is on the left, and the completed um, picture, which was in Gleanings of the Menagerie in Avery at Knowsley Hall, um, is on the right. He actually painted it in 1835, so just when Lord, Derby was, uh, Lord Stanley was becoming Lord Derby. Um, and it was published quite a lot later, 11 years later, in Gleanings. Um, the cranes were named after Lord Derby, um, at Lord Stanley, as he was then, by Nicholas Vigors. He was the secretary of the zoo. Um, in 1826, and they're from South Africa. They were kept at Nosley for many years, and they were very easy to keep. They just kind of wandered about. And in fact, they used to be kept on the lawn in front of the house, and Lord Derby and his family could look out and see them displaying to each other. They used to dance to each other. Apparently, their display is absolutely lovely dance. Um, but they only bred in 1844 and 1845. Um, and... Um, a couple of years after, the, after that, uh, this was really the result of most of them. It's the chicks hatched, lasted a few days, and then their mothers sat on them. So um, this is actually a specimen we have in our collections that died in the Avery in 1847. So it, they had a bit of success, but I think they're probably quite uh, difficult to keep. I think Lear had a very soft spot for the Stanley Crane, because if you look at a lot of his cartoons and vignettes, they have got the Stanley Crane in them. Um, one of the main ones is the Pelican Chorus. So it's got a, there's the Pelican, um, and there's the Crane, which actually has got um, an ordinary heron head, um, and this tail here is based on the Stanley Crane. If you actually look at the poem, he does go on about the kings of, crane, of cranes, all grandly dressed. Such a lovely tale. Its feathers float between the ends of his blue dress coat. So if you look, see the blue dress coat here? Um, with pea green trousers, also neat, and a delicate frill to hide his feet. So when you get to the feet... You're, he's actually moved on to something else. So it's what you might call a composite bird. But he does... The, the cranes do crop up a lot in his poems. 
Um, other favourites, I think, of Lear's, this is the Orinoco Goose. Um, it's, this is the original of the plate in gleanings from the, from the Menagerie in Avery at Knowsley Hall. And it was painted by Lear in July 1836. Now, if you notice, there's two birds in the background here, and they're courting. And their courtship involves this rather weird thing where they stand up very, very tall and puff all their neck feathers up out and make quite a weird noise. And they were obviously doing this quite a lot at Knowsley. Um, this, we think, is the bird in the picture. So there's the bird in the picture. And there is the individual that he drew. Um, you can usually tell if it's a Lear specimen because they usually have about 10 labels on them, usually referring to how important they are taxonomically because a lot of the specimens that Lear painted were original to science and had only just been described. Some of them were types, which is the standard on which that species is based. But a lot of them we've also tracked where he painted them and that sort of thing. So they've got a label saying all that as well. If you look at this, this is the finished lithograph, so it's actually the other way around. It's a mirror image. You can see them puffed up here, and he really loved this. He does refer to this quite a lot in his um, poems and often his letters, he'll say, you know, those Orinoco geese have been at it again. Um, and this is a cartoon in a private collection here. It's called Adieu to Nosley. Um, Edward Lear, we think, is actually in a window um, of the house saying goodbye to the Stanley families, and there were a lot of Stanleys, because Lord Derby had a large, um, a large family of his own, and his father had a lot of small children when Lord Stanley was quite old, so there were hundreds of them, and they're all trying to get into the same carriage. <laughs> and here we are with all the um, Avery animals saying goodbye. So we have an owl, of course, as a crown crane saying goodbye, and here is an Oro Orinoco goose, and it's saying goodbye, puff, and it's all puffed up. So he just kept using that image. And I just like the coachman here going, oh no, no more, please. <laughs> and proof that they did actually puff themselves up um, successfully is that there are chicks in our collection that were um, hatched in the Nosley Averys. And this is actually on display. I took this just before um, I pinned it into a drawer in our brand new Museum of Liverpool, which is on the waterfront, which is a museum about Liverpool as opposed to about the world, which um, World Museum, as it is now, is about. Um, and we, we've put quite a lot of um, Lord Derby specimens into a case about Knowsley in that museum. And it's covered with Edward Lear's rhymes as well. So people absolutely love it. There's all Edward Lear's books in a little bookcase so people can sit down and read them. So that's pinned into a drawer where nobody can get it out. Um, along with a Nene chick, because he did manage to breed the Sandwich Island goose, who was the first person ever to do so. Um, it was eventually saved from extinction by Peter Scott at Slimbridge. Lear also did um, a lot of uh, mammal pictures. Um, Lord Derby also had a huge amount of smallish mammals in his collection. He didn't have one of these, unfortunately, otherwise they might still not uh, be extant and not extinct. Um, but this is the famous Tasmanian tiger. I think quite obviously not done from a living specimen, but from a mount. There are quite a lot of mounts in London in places like the British Museum, collections. Um, and this was bought quite recently. It was in private hands, and the Tasmanian Museum managed to buy it. So it's now in a place where everyone can see it. This is um, an Australian marsupial. Um, it's, a, it's called uh, an eastern quoll, or native cat. It's nothing to do with cats, but it did do the same sort of thing. I, it, when the convicts first landed in Australia, they were a real problem because they used to get into the chicken house and kill all the chickens. So that's why they, they got called cats, really. Um, they were often um, 
trapped or shot or whatever, because they were a nuisance. And of course, now they're very, very rare. Um, this was done from a living specimen in Lord Darby's menagerie. And you can really tell the difference between that done from a, a dead stuffed specimen and that that was done from a living specimen. Um, so Lear must have sat there and had the opportunity to really sketch it properly. If you notice, this animal has a white tip to its tail, which is a bit unusual in this species, and also it's a bit weird. That's the specimen from which that picture was done. So there's the Lear sketch done um, in 1834, and here is the animal that died in 1836. So it's almost certainly the same animal. And again, if you look, it's got a white tip to its tail and it's slightly offset. And we think what's happened is that somebody's broken the end of the tail and that last vertebra means it's kind of dropped a bit. You can see there, instead of being smooth, this bit kind of comes off the bottom. And if you look at that one, it's the same in that picture. So that's um, an image that's still at Nosley, that painting's still at Nosley. And here's one in Chicago, in private hands, um, belongs to uh, somebody I've been working with the last few years. He's been really, really helpful. He's got quite a lot of original layers, and he's very interested in what they were painted from. And again, you can see the slightly broken white tail. So it's from the same individual. And I guess if you've got a good subject, you do it again and again. And I know later on, um, Lear's technique was to have loads of different sketches of the same animal, um, and then he'd rush round and do like he'd do the browns, and then he'd do all the greens and the whites and that sort of thing. And he certainly did the same with his landscape art. It's a bit not like painting with numbers, because he was a great artist. But if you want to do something quickly, you do the same, same colour on different uh, paintings at the same time. Um, just a little bit now about current scientific work, because that's where I am still involved. Um, we're still looking for any specimens that Edward Lear described. He was a scientist himself. He did describe new species to science. Um, or he illustrated uh, new species to science. Um, the culminate, culminated toucan, which is actually now a subspecies, and it's this one here, um, uh, of one of the um, toucans. This was a, a species that was described by John Gould, um, but illustrated by John, uh, Edward Lear in the monograph of the toucans. And there is a copy um, on display outside, and it's got the Toco toucan open. It's one of his most fa famous toucan pictures. Now, um, people kept asking me, they kept saying, well, we can't find the type of... Uh, the culminated toucan, and even though it's a subspecies, we need to know what the type is for sure. So it's something that looks like that, because we're not quite sure which subspecies are really subspecies. We need to look at the genetics of the whole group. And they kept writing to me and saying, look, you must have it. You've got so many other layers. And the trouble with me is my eyesight's not great, and I was looking for something that had a red edge to the beak. I kept going into the collections and going, well... Even if it's not red now, it would be some sort of a beige stripe. And it was only when somebody who was visiting pointed out that that's the tongue and not the beak at all that I realised the moral of this story is always get a second opinion. <laughs> so I then started looking in the collection for something that didn't have a stripe on its beak, and there it is. It was there all the time. I've got a picture of it here. With This one's quite famous, so it's been produced as a... Um, as a postcard. Um, so we do have the type, uh, a Gouldian type, um, which is also illustrated by Edward Lear, so it's doubly important. So we've had to move that out of its ordinary drawer into what we call the type drawers. Um, and the type drawers have three locks on them, and they also have a little orange sticker that sticks out of them. So if there's a fire, the firemen rush in and save those cabinets first. So it's gone into the really, really important cabinets. And um, if you look at the label there, it's a temporary label that I've got on it, um, which says, as well as a specimen mentioned by Gould, that's John Gould, 
in his text for monograph of the Ramphastidae in 1834, this is probably one of the types of his Proxal Sock, so Proceedings of the Zoolog Zoological Society of London, description in 1834. Um, and it's a temporary label and it's in, in pencil because until it's been published, we are not allowed to write in ink on a red label and call it a type. It's a very, very kind of strong thing about curation. Until you've actually published something, you can't put it on a proper label. So um, that's sitting in my things to do urgently drawer. It's been there for about a year, I'm afraid. Um, but what I need to do is to um, publish that somewhere. Um, we're now including the fact that if you put it on the web, it's published. We're going to have to do that for future because you can't publish everything in every, uh, these days. So we need to put it on the web properly and then it will be published and I can put a proper red label with ink on it and write a bit better than I have there. So that's one that's ongoing. This is the one that's a complete nightmare. I think you might have seen it was referred to in um, the, the uh, advertisements for this lecture. Lear himself um, was the person who described Bodan's cockatoo. So if you, it's, he described it in, um, in the, the illustrations of the Sataki Dai. Um, the type description isn't very large because all it is is the writing on the picture. And all it says is Bodine's cockatoo, Philipterinchus Bodini, Lear. So it was described by Lear. It doesn't really say anything else. Now, Ron Johnson, who works at the Western Australia Museum, he's the bird curator there, has been working on this bird for years. And he's discovered um, that, in fact, it's two species. So the black and white cockatoo that lives in southwest Western Australia is actually two species. One, so there were two species. So Mr. Carnaby uh, came along in 1948. Um, and thought, right, OK, two species, so I'm going to describe the other one. So he described Carnaby's cockatoo, um, which is otherwise called the short-billed black cockatoo, but I don't think he looked at Lear's plate. I got a message from uh, Paul Sweet, who's the curator in New York, saying that Ron had asked him if he had the type of Bodan's cockatoo, because they really needed to look at it. Um, a lot of those Gould, um, the Lyrian specimens from illustrations of Sitakidae did also end up in America. And Paul's kind of the central um, point for a lot of people to ask questions about where things are. So he emailed me and said, well, have you got it? So I looked in the collection, and if you look at the bottom of here, it says, in the collection of Mr Ledbetter, who was a dealer in London. Anyway, I found it. It was in the ordinary collection. It's no longer in the ordinary collection. Got it out, said Mr. Ledbetter, and it said this is the type. I thought, great. Um, I told Ron. He emailed back and said, oh, I can have some pictures. Um, I sent him some pictures, and he said, the problem is what we call Bodan's cockatoo now has got a long beak. Can you see the problem? What, we, what is the type of Bodan's cockatoo is what they've been calling Carnaby's cockatoo since 1948. So we've got two possibilities here. We can burn every single mention in every single Australian field guide or scrap of paper that mentions Bodan's cockatoo, or we can apply to the International Council of Zoological Nomenclature and overturn the type. So this will no longer be the type of Bodan's cockatoo because, it, in fact, it is a Carnaby's cockatoo. <laughs> so Ron's written them a long letter and they've written a letter back saying, well, maybe, we're thinking about it. <laughs> um, and what Ron's got to do now is to find a really good specimen of what he knows is Bodan's, so it's got a long beak. Um, and actually, the International Council have suggested that they do the genetics before they decide. So the genetics has been done. I've got to send a bit of the, what is the type, or was the type, 
Um, and Ron's going to have to look at quite a lot of the specimens because there's always a possibility that there are more than two species. They absolutely know that there are at least two because Carnaby's behaves very differently from the other one. It's got a different call and that sort of thing. Um, so that's a big project and it's going to be ongoing for some time. How are we doing for time? Okay. Um, Edward Lear found doing animal pictures very, very difficult on his eyes. He was always, always wore spectacles and things. If you do natural history art, you can imagine the tiny little brush strokes that you have to use um, to create a really good picture. And he kept saying to Lord Derby, look, I can't see anymore. You know, I want to be a landscape artist. It's much easier. So in the end, Lord Derby, who absolutely, obviously absolutely adored him, said, OK, you can go off to the Mediterranean or wherever you want to go. You can go to India, go wherever you like. I will pay for you and you can be a natural history uh, a landscape artist. Um, so this is one he did in 1854. This was just three years after the 13th Earl died. Um, and he was in Egypt at the time. He did travel all over the Mediterranean and the kind of near bit of Asia and produced an astonishing amount of beautiful, beautiful landscapes. Uh, this is a sketch um, which is in one of our National Museums, uh, Liverpool's. Um, I think we've got 11 venues now. Um, and this is the Walker Art Gallery, very famous art gallery we have, that's got quite a few of his sketches and an absolutely huge oil of his, um, of Bethlehem. Um, so that's what he spent the rest of his life doing. Um, he had a villa called Villa Tennyson in San Remo, um, off the, just, just on the coast, really, of Italy. There's a picture of it now um, at the top there. And he had a faithful servant called Giorgio Coccali, and he had a faithful co cat called Foss, who had lost the end of his... Uh, tale and Foss turns up in many, many of his cartoons. So um, he actually, despite all his ill health throughout his life, um, he didn't die till 1888, so he was quite an old man. And he's buried in the San Remo cemetery um, there next to his faithful servant, Giorgio. So Giorgio's there and Edward Lear is here. So if you go to San Remo, you must be sure to visit him. Um, he's remembered in so many ways, but really mainly through his uh, caricatures and nonsense rhymes. And there's the stamps that were produced in the 80s, and that one's actually been signed by the 18th Earl of Derby there. Um, so that was sent from Liverpool. I think the, the 18th Earl spent hours signing a lot of the uh, covers for charity. And there you have Foss there with the tail. You always tell Foss with the missing tail. Um, and others which here, the young lady whose bonnet, the birds of the world, sat upon it. And a lot of those, I know the individuals in it. And there's the, cat, uh, the owl and the pussycat again. As I said, uh, the new Museum of Liverpool is um, just here. Um, there's a real complex here of wonderful things. Maritime Museum... Tate Gallery just around the corner, waterfront there, um, and there is a little, uh, a little display um, on Edward Lear in there, which will be permanent at least for the next five years. So if you're in Liverpool, um, it's in the mezzanine, and you can tell it instantly because there's a case covered in Edward Lear rhymes. And just to end with, it's my favourite Edward Lear picture. Um, it's a picture of Mrs Gould's pet... So John Gould's wife, Elizabeth, um, her pet, short-tailed field vole, and that was an original, uh, again, in the house. And I just love the way he's obviously gone, oh, can I just, you know, he was visiting Gould, oh, could I just get that out and draw it? So there we are. Um, short story about uh, Edward Lear. Um, I've just bought a couple of things. I couldn't carry too much, really. Um, we did do a pic uh, an exhibition at the Walker of Edward Lear's originals that are at Knowsley in the 70s. So um, do have a look at that. And I've also bought a printout of the Edward Lear Bicentenary events. Uh, if you go into a blog of Bosch on the internet, um, you can find them. But if anyone wants to have a look at what's coming up, because there's still lots more talks 
and events about Edward Lear this year, then come and have a look at that. Um, any questions? <laughs> so much for that, Clem. Um, it was really, sorry, I'm just going to share the platform with you for one minute. <laughs> um, really interesting to hear about the way that um, uh, scientists today are still using um, things, drawings that were done, you know, a, a very long time ago and the, the interactions between the, the museum staff, obviously really important in um, still uh, these uh, investigations of the birds today. So, so that was fantastic. Um, we do have a little bit of time for questions. If you could put your hand up and I'll come to you with the um, microphone and then Thank you very much for your very interesting and informative talk. Um, was there a relationship uh, directly and consciously, consciously between Lear and photography, such as it existed in his era? Um, Sorry, photography. Photography. Um, fauna had been photographed in the previous century, the very end of that century, so was there any direct contact? What, what sort of influence might there have been between the advent of photography in his era and Lear? And did Lear have a taxonomic and evolutionary theory of his own? when he was deciding what to include in his pictures. Uh, right. You can hear me, can't you? Um, evolutionary theory. OK, so he's right on the cusp of all this. Um, and you can see people beginning to really discuss evolution openly. I mean, he did know Charles Darwin and things like that, so he must have known about that sort of discussion um, and things. But so what you're asking is, did he understand the process when he was um, describing new species? Well, when you draw something, yeah. you're not really acting as a, as a camera as such. You're making selections to what you do. Yes. Like yeah. So therefore, what influenced him in what he selected, in what he um, emphasised? Did he have a taxonomic theory he was applying? I, I don't think so. I think... The only, th the only book he did himself was the illustrations of the Satakidae, the, the illustrations of the parrots. Now, he did that when he was between 16 and 20. So I think he just chose parrots that he could find. I don't think there was a selection process saying, ooh, I wonder if that one's related to that, so I'm going to draw it um, to compare it with that one. I think it was just what's available to him, because that's why you see Nicholas Vigors pet parrot turns up in illustrations of the sataki die um, because it was there so i don't i don't think he was thinking about the relationships between birds then and that bodan's parrot uh, that's a very early drawing it's just obviously much much later that people realized that it was actually that species was two two parrots and as for f f photography, I don't. I think there is a photograph of Edward Lear himself, but I'm not sure that photography was um, common enough in his time for him to use. Does that answer at all? I was just trying to think of anything that he, anything. I think by the time photography came in, he probably stopped doing illustrations of most of his illustrations of natural history subjects when the 13th Earl died in 51. And it really wasn't very common then, photography. It was really in its infancy. So I don't think he would have take, you know, had any recourse to taking pictures of landscapes or whatever. So, anyone else? Oh. Just say a little bit more about the relationship between Edward Lear of the Goulds, because Gould was very famous for having drawn the illustrations of the birds that came back from the Galapagos in the zoology of the Beagle. Yeah, yeah. So you said he knew Darwin. Did he really know him? We just met him all. Uh, th there is, you know, th there is proof that they knew each other. There were letters other, mentioning yes. them. But what about I mean, the relationship with the Goulds? That's very well, I think Maureen should answer that. <laughs> And she's looking really worried, actually, because Lear was quite rude about Gould in some of his letters. 
I think Gould, I always say to, to Maureen that Gould reminds me of Richard Branson, in that he, he was just really, really good at being a businessman. Um, and he could see things before anyone else did. And he saw the kind of future in big illustrated books before anyone else did. But the trouble is then he wanted his artists to work really, really fast. And one of his artists was his wife, Elizabeth, um, you know, who he produced the most huge amount of paintings, despite the fact that she had several children. And there are, Lear did write to various people going, oh, God, I've got to do 400 things in an hour and... He keeps saying, you know, coming and saying you must work faster. And sometimes you'll find on Lear sketches things like, Gould says this is wrong, and, and things like that. So I think it's this thing about an entrepreneur and his staff that often the staff can't keep up with the entrepreneur. Um, so I don't think it was all that comfortable, a relationship. Whereas the one with the 13th Earl... Um, you know, I always wonder how uh, Lear managed to escape from Knowsley in '39, because um, Lord Derby was still quite a young man then. Because they, you know, obviously had such a bond. I mean, he ended up being tutored to his children and eating with the family, because of course he'd started off in the servants' hall. So, thank you. We now consider um, Lear to be a national treasure. Was he considered so in his day? Um, not, not like he is now, I don't think. I mean, I think he is most noted for his nonsense rhymes. And, of course, he produced those much later on in his life. It was natural history art, and then he kind of, as he got in with the staff, uh, uh, the staff and the family at Knowsley, he started writing those rhymes for the children. Um, and I think they were quite popular when they first came out. But it's, I mean, I remember from my youth that, y you know, everyone knows the owl and the pussycat and things, but I wonder if it's only actually the last kind of 100 years that that's been so. Um, and he wasn't a rich man when he died. You know, his villa Tennyson was a very little vi villa. You know, he had a servant but um, he was funded out of his, what he, he sold his pictures for. And as I was saying before, you know, he did his pictures by numbers, so he'd have four sketches of Egypt up and he'd be painting in, you know, oh, I must do the reds now. So he had to work really, really quickly to make a living. So now I don't think he was well known, but I think he was content at the end of his life because a lot of his life he suffered from depression. He wasn't...